Hi, Henry. Hello, Nick. How are you feeling at this moment now in this room? Comfortable. Physically comfortable? Physically comfortable. Mentally comfortable. Obviously, this is the place that I'm probably happiest. Mm -hmm. You're in the lion's den here, slightly. Mm -hmm. The role's reversed. You're, you're in situ in your studio. Yeah. Um, I'm, in, I'm a stranger in a strange land. We'll, we'll specifically go through the jungles, the horizon lines, and the Thames series. Yeah. But what I wanted to ask you about, because what struck me looking at these your work and following the progress of your work over the years, is the intense involvement with the materials that you use. Mm. It seems to be such a, a, a crucial and essential core of your making. Yeah. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, firstly, I think, you know, there are certain things in life that people are instinctually repelled to or attracted to. And um, I've always had a interest in the other. Um, mm -hmm. What I mean by that is um, materiality on a different mm -hmm. level. And it sort of started really with my mom and dad saying, you know, you should never be bored. And through that, uh, I used to call it top drawer art because it's the drawer in your house that's full of sellotape or blue tack or things that we would discard or have a function in some way or another. And that would be dumped on the table. And so there was always a area to play with other things. Um, and so um, I've sort of maintained that, um, or as I said, instinctively um, always gone back to that scenario. So you're making art out of whatever's available. Right. It's not some rarefied process. Yeah. And I think you spoke to me once about Initially, I didn't use oils because I couldn't afford. Yes, the plasticine was a, was a substitute initially. Yes, was part of the reason. Yes, and there's there's something about that. There's a almost a socialist perspective about using what's at hand. Yeah, and I think I think that really comes through in your work. Is is that yeah. that sense of what's at hand, whether it's the geography of the Thames mm. um, or, or what's around you here. Mm. Growing up, this idea of having a a mask, which I know we touched on before. The first time I came to see you, one of the first things in your notes that, that you'd said was I was I was obsessed with getting rid of this mask mm -hmm. or not playing to mm -hmm. uh, some sort of audience, whether that was mm -hmm. real or not. Of course, it's not real. There's no audience. Mm -hmm. We're all in our own sort of melodrama mm -hmm. to a degree. All the world is a state. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of the work was based on fictitious characters. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was listening to Nick Cave talking about this. You know, he used to write songs, ballads for certain people. He'd give them a name. A bit like my Young Sen series. You know, I made a fictional character so I could explore my deeper fears, anxieties, um, hopes. And the obsession with William Hogarth was quite prominent because obviously he's a London-based artist. And um, I'd come up from the countryside to do that. Um, so from that series of with the figuration through to the jungles, which were about escapism and, and, and mm -hmm. colour, but were still dystopian visions or uh, kind of Blakeian visions, mm -hmm. you know, about dream and mind states, to the Thames mm -hmm. um, and the Horizons, which were actually my own experience. Mm -hmm. Me here grounded walking the Thames or me mm -hmm. up in the uh, mm -hmm. airplane uh, thinking about landscape painting from the stratosphere. Mm -hmm. There was a shift there, and that came with age and confidence, I think. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, having you there too, through this period of six years since I've been sober, mm -hmm. you could literally, on a time scale, see the transition of me getting sober and starting to have real honest conversations about my mental health, about where I am and all the other things that one has to deal with in life to those artworks. I mean, quite literally, the dense feeling of being in a jungle, the overwhelming sense of these things fighting for survival and things clambering on top of each other to the elevation to the air where you have these very pure pigmented pieces with this sort of very simple line or this idea of a line, mm -hmm. um, which of course there isn't. Coming back to this, um, the truth of masks and the discarding of masks, mm. 
when you talked about the jungles then, and we've both talked about it in the sort of Werner Herzog's uh, perspective on the jungle, it is a place of murder and mayhem, yeah. something like yeah, that. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's not a cuddly place. Yeah. And, and there's a sense when you talk about that stifling and the fact that there's no people there, that these are, are very remote landscapes in time and space. Yeah. And the sense of rising up that to this pristine horizon yeah. line at sort of 35,000 feet. I almost took a breath the way you talk about it because you can feel that uh, transition up to that place and this incredible suddenly the world opens up you know you're not strangled as you mentioned mental health yeah and in a sense mental health's a modern conception mm. it's you know 19th century onwards before that it would be you'd be possessed of demons or um yeah or the muse and i wondered whether um the mental health side whether that feels like a, an imposition whether it's useful to the art or whether it muffles the art? Well, firstly, would I rather not have mental health issues? Okay, and let's, let's mm -hmm. put that in brackets because mm -hmm. I think, as you've explained, we have terminology for these things, which is great. We, it's a moving thing, but like everything else in life, it's organic. So mm -hmm. in another hundred years, we might have other terminology around mm -hmm. what it is that people are suffering for. It's, it's like the jungles, it proliferates endlessly. But to answer a question, would I like to live like this? I know when I, one of the reasons I came to see you is because I had this brain fog. I was literally in a sort of a, a state where um, I couldn't see through the fog. And there were days where I was literally crippled by my inability to communicate, which seems strange because right now I feel very articulate and clean. I get less and less of it. Um, sorry, I'm going to have to deal with the dog. You said that is at this moment I'm comfortable, I'm articulate, yeah. I'm fluent, I can articulate my ideas. Yes. It feels a long way. When we first met, it was it was like the beginning of the, of the inferno, you know. Yes. Midway upon the course of my life, I found myself lost in a dark wood and you know how I got there and could not remember or something. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's it's sort of a classic um place to be. And look, there's your ancestry, there's your lineage, mm. there's your whatever you call it, provenance or whatever, you've got architects in there, yeah. you've got explorers, yeah. you've got the new world as well as the old world. Yeah. That can work both ways. Having that, that kind of illustrious ancestors, it can silence us, yeah. it can stifle us, or it can inspire us. Is that ever been a factor for you? Or I don't know. My brother, for example, doesn't have a passport, you know, and would rather be in a wood in, in England and doesn't drive, and, you know, he's kind of the opposite to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, he has the same family history. Mm -hmm. I guess it just, that's the way the cookie crumbled or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I somehow, like my father, have a love for travel. I have a mm -hmm. love for different cultures. Um, and I try and do as much of it as I possibly can. I think going back to your question about the mental health, because I think I answered the first bit, which is, would I rather not have these sort of, mm -hmm spouts or issues in my life yes but then i suppose the counter argument for that would be there are bursts of great energy or there are great bursts of creativity and again i can't necessarily see it you know as much as i uh, love and admire and respect you i turn up every week and see you well that's a discipline but also something i have to do mm -hmm. because if i don't do it mm -hmm. i don't know what the consequences are going to be mm -hmm. whether that's go back to drinking drugs or I might lose everything because I've been in a place where I didn't have the support and there was the drinking drugs and I nearly lost the art so getting sober was creatively a better place for me to be in a sense the question is slightly disingenuous you know my own history is, is not dissimilar in many respects right. I have no doubt of, of the answer I've yeah. needed that support and when you speak about here of the studio what I was always struck by from the beginning, you, you described it as a cooperative venture, you know, where obviously it's your ideas and all the rest of it, but realized and bounced off others. Yeah. So instead of it being locked in a, you know, yeah. a garret somewhere, there's something about that. Yes. Moving into action and, and being realized. Yes. And that's really important. And, you know, like going to Donatello's exhibition recently in the mm -hmm. V&A, you know, really exposed that, that there was a collective. I mean, the whole of the Renaissance, you know, there was a sharing of ideas, but really there were, yes, there were central figures, but there were lots of people. And sometimes something would be made somewhere and then taken somewhere else to be finished or worked on by somebody else. There was a collective spirit. And, you know, the idea 
which I admire greatly in painters, which is this idea of complete isolation and painting alone and everything. I just find that too much to bear to a degree. I mean, I love to use paint and I love to, I love all sort of forms of imagery and um, any sort of art form. How you get there is often, as I've got older, kind of much more interesting and much more important. What I mean by that is when you see a picture in a gallery, the job of the artist at that point is done. Yeah, yeah. For me, what became really important is, again, the sense of, uh, yes, funded by me. Yes, I'm the captain of the ship. I am the artist. They're all my ideas. But I really bounce off the feeling of having a studio and a collective of people that have come through the studio. You know, until I was about 25, I made everything myself. And so to make have the leap of faith, which I think is another thing we could talk about, having faith in something beyond your own abilities is also really a crucial and important sort of aspect to working in a workshop-like studio. I feel steadier and calmer and responsible for other people. And that makes me feel better. Again, one of the things that I mentioned to you when I got sober was the most important thing for me was the studio. It was about the place of work. So yeah, I get a great enjoyment from the studio and the studio encompasses other people, a sense of responsibility, showing up, having faith in other people, you know, things that actually really make us better, more sculpted or rounded individual, I would argue. Okay, this dog is really out of control. <laughs> what I get with you, there's something about this being visible in the studio, having the confidence, talking about the leap of faith, mm. to be seen. This into action lark, this moving into declaring your ideas and realizing them in materials, yeah. is is a hugely exposing thing. Yeah. It's it's you know, I think it's the most therapeutic. If you want to use those sorts of terms that yeah. I think of. It's to be, it's having the courage to be foolish. I remember you saying to me about, well, do I need to kind of focus on one thing? Will it, will it make me seem frivolous? These aren't your words. These are my kind of paraphrasing. If I, you know, engage in it, but my desire is to engage in all these materials. Yeah. From the yeah. tapestries, uh, the rest of it, there were, there were lots of things that went off. Yeah. They're not cul-de-sacs, but they were, they were roots. They were convoluted roots to here. Yeah. Maintaining that child's like quality, which you can doubt because you know being playful is not always easy or you doubt yourself or you question yourself but what i do here in, in the studio is you know something that's dead and dormant you know woodbury type prints that i spent two years working on that no one really ever saw or some people did but no one really was interested in them you know early photographic sort of uh, process you know Again, the tapestries or the mm -hmm. ceramics I make with my brother or plasticine, this sort of cheap, childlike thing that people will tell you is sort of silly. Well, you know, okay, well, it might be silly, but here's what you can do with it. Yeah. You know, and, and suddenly it's not silly anymore. But of course, it hurts if someone says mm -hmm. they're silly or they don't like them. That's why social media is actually a sort of horrible it's a good format because we're able to do this and I'm able to speak directly to people about who I am and what I do. Mm -hmm. um, the comments or the people that were trying to be negative is not Never held the line, never look at the comments. It's yeah, no, it's not. But look, I mean, we, 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 we've had this conversation before and I think it's so important in, in your case as well. That the, I think it was Marlon Brando said, if I go into a room and there's 200 people there and one of them doesn't like me, I have to leave. Yeah. And I think we all recognise that that sensitivity yeah. and, and thin skinness. And it, it's it's we've talked to you know, it's back to everybody I know or ever worked with has got that thing where they, they can they can extrapolate a you know, a thread of negativity from an ocean of affirmation. If they can <laughs> they can find that bit in there where somebody somebody didn't join in the yeah. applause. Yeah, 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 well, yeah. And, and that's why I think this this business of the studio and being able to come into the studio and and, and reveal yourself, yeah, and do all the various bits of it, it, it it's 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 the antidote, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that that place. Absolutely, it? But it doesn't mean you know we always you know do I not bleed? We all we're always wounded, yeah, by always this stuff. And yeah, I think that's that's the signature of being human. Yeah, and, it's and that's that's what the horizon lines are about as well. You know, they're not necessarily discussed because they're meant to be 
or they were done by me being in an aeroplane, an empty aeroplane going back to America during COVID, this empty vessel flying thousands of them. And I had my iPad and I thought, how do you capture the purity and blue, the blue stratosphere? You know, how do you paint a landscape from the air? And that's where it came about. But this cut is really important. And this cut is, you know, again, inward and outward. It's about all kinds of cutting. Mm -hmm. It's about scars, inward mm -hmm. scars, outward scars. It's about trauma. Mm -hmm. It's about all of those paintings mm -hmm. of people's throats being cut, like mm -hmm. Caravaggio. Mm -hmm. um, it's all those things and, and. I mean, I said in, in the other interview that, that you can hear them, especially when you talk about the cuts. We've had these huge cuts. Remember the volcano in Iceland, so all air travel was suspended mm. for a while. That's like a cut that can't be predicted. COVID, global, lives have changed after it. You know, people work from home and all this business. The whole world changed. And my sense with you is they are those paradigm changing events. You're in motion. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's the other thing that you also mentioned and um, the idea that we murder to dissect. As the plane's traveling through this pristine, yeah, it's spewing out whatever. Chemtrails. Chemtrails. I think Blake says something similar where the poet dips his, his quill into the, the pristine spring and of course stains the water. It's yeah. a great little yeah, yeah. That, yeah. illustration of that. Speaking of water, the 10 series, the water pieces, mm -hmm. and just getting back to how those are made and where I'm at with those, um, is with those, there's a real act of faith because unlike the jungles or the horizons where you build up layers like mm -hmm. years and years of sedimentary rock or something where they're, you know, um, these are done back to front. So they're done on mm -hmm. sheets of glass. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I put down will eventually be the thing that you is revealed when you pull it back up. And this way, there's something really about letting go, like water. The Thames runs through English poetry from the beginning. I mean, a lot of the mm. lines from the, the Wasteland and, and, and later the Four Quartet that we've also had a glimpse at mm. is a river runs through it. It's, it's it, the sense I got seeing that your last Plasticine jungle is a river. Yeah. He heading down into the valley. And yeah. in a sense, it's the beginning of the Thames and all the rest. Of yeah. It. It's such a surrender to the material. Yeah, yeah. And that's the bit for me is the kind of, um, that's the arrival. That's, that's, that's the full-blooded human being. Yeah. It's the don't knowing which is what excites me about you and your work, mm. is, is this fact that you're able, you have the confidence to stay with the, the unknown. It's not easy to keep experimenting. If you've refined yourself to the idea that you are an oil painter, well, there's canvas and there's oil. You can spend more time thinking about the image that you're painting because it's not, there's no debate going on. There's no time spent in trying to figure out how materials work or new materials or old materials which is again something that i'm really interested in i mean currently you know I'm, because of this show at unit you know the first thing i did the day after uh, it got hung is i went back to the ai images that i've been working with and i feel i've maybe found a way of moving working with the ai and working with fresco painting mm -hmm. so you know and combining those two so i feel like i've found a math equation now mm -hmm. You know that I binged AI and it did a lot of pain to my mental health. I, suddenly I found myself in this brain fog again. And you have to listen to these things. You know, they are telling you, your brain tells you things. And so I disregarded it. I didn't look at it for a while. But because of the show that's hung, I realized having all those three different works on the wall, no, you must keep moving forward. You must keep experimenting. So the morning afterwards, as I just got up the latest images that I'd done on art, artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, and boom, 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 within 24 hours, all of those little scraps that had been floating around here in my house, you know, in the car, in the sketchbooks, suddenly there it was, this this thing, Eureka, this eureka slight moment, which happened with the plasticine too. I remember having a moment with plasticine. You've done it. Yeah, yeah. You're declaring yourself each time. You're putting yourself. That's why you get the noise. That's a good. That's always a good sign when you get the noise on social media. <laughs> so the lunatics come chiming in. That tells you you're in the world, and that's that's you're near the money. If yeah. You're throwing things up in the air, and if it's radical, it will it will disturb. Yeah. And it will and you'll you'll get the feedback. It's always a good sign. You constantly need courage. And look, at times it's really really tricky. And what I do now is I get on a plane and I go to countries that can stimulate me massively. So whether it's going to 
halfway to Papua New Guinea yeah. or I just went mm -hmm. to Ivory Coast or to learn about and see other cultures. That's what I do to get away. It's the soberest thing that I can do. And the happiest I've ever been in my life, actually.